Welcome to today's ACRE at ANU student presentation session, Philosophy. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet, and pay respect to the elders past and present. My name is Aidan Delaney and I will be chairing today's session. Our first presenter today is Evelyn Richards. Uh, please start when you're ready. Hello everybody, welcome to my talk titled Hobbes and Rousseau Identical or Opposite Towards a Comprehensive Critique of Social Contract Theory. I'll begin by introducing you to the main puzzle I'm exploring, my key message, and then I'll take you through each stage of my argument and we'll conclude uh, with a bit of reflection on my findings. So, Thomas Hobbes and Jean-Jacques Rousseau are both Enlightenment thinkers. Um, they are hugely influential in political philosophy um, and have both uh, produced theories using social contract theory. The literature on social contract theory understands these authors as producing um, opposite ideas about political structure. Uh, so Hobbes is understood as an absolutist, meaning that he is meant to advocate for a political system where the government has absolute power over the people. And Rousseau is meant to be a Republican who advocates for a political system where the people give permission to the government to rule over them. Um, during my research, however, I found that contrary to the literature and the understanding that they present opposite theories, uh, Hobbes and Rousseau actually present what can be understood as essentially the same structural theory of government. So my puzzle is um, that can we use social contract theory to justify specific regime types such as absolutism or republicanism? Um, and my key message, which you'll take home at the end of this, is that, my con is that conventional, conventional wisdom is mistaken. Um, social contract theory cannot be used to justify specific regime types. So what is social contract theory? It answers three fundamental um, questions on government. Firstly, why do we need government? Secondly, who has the right to govern? And third, what is the role of government? So the first question is answered um, with the problem of the state of nature. In social contract theory, this is a hypothetical situation um, of anarchy, meaning there is no government, there's no law, there's no rules, and there's no enforcement. So it's a free for all. It ends up being competitive and um, ultimately violent. So this problem gives rise to the need of government, which occurs through the process of the social contract. Um, it is a process of consent um, where everybody comes together to consent to a specific arrangement of government, um, and then government is legitimate to rule. Um, the role of government is therefore simply to provide better conditions than the state of nature to enable cooperation in society. So what does the literature say on Hobbes and Rousseau's conceptualization of the state of nature? Well, Hobbes is said to produce a very bleak uh, understanding of the state of nature. He says it's a war of everybody against everybody. Um, everybody has equal uh, capabilities and they're equally competitive for resources. So we can think of this as sort of a dog eat dog kind of situation. Um, we then have Rousseau who criticizes Hobbes for um, imbuing all these societal passions onto the natural man, such as greed and violence. He says these characteristics only emerge uh, when society starts to develop and the purity of people starts to degrade. Um, so Rousseau paints a much more um, favorable picture of the state of nature. It's sort of like a Garden of Eden. There's not much interaction between people. There's an abundance of resources and there's no violence. So we can think of this as solitude as bliss. The problem is that Rousseau criticizes Hobbes um, for doing exactly what he ends up doing with the state of nature. So Rousseau says, Begin state of nature is a wonderful place, and then it slowly devolves when people start to claim property into a situation of um, great inequality where some people are ruled over um, by others. Um, and he says government should be put in place to lessen that sort of impurity. Um, but Rousseau uh, ends up essentially before the social contract comes into being, which creates government, suggesting that the state of nature is a horrible and violent place. Um, and then Therefore, um, he understands uh, the same problem in the state of nature as Hobbes does, and therefore uh, views the social contract as the same solution. Um, so the social contract, who has the right to govern? Um, Hobbes has the idea of Leviathan. So what he says is that everybody in the state of nature comes together to unanimously and mutually give their consent to relinquish their completely individual rights uh, for the good of the common people. Um, so what that means is everyone comes together, they form a, a unity. He calls that unity the sovereign, um, and that sovereign is the Leviathan. And individuals submit themselves to the rule of the Leviathan who has absolute power to rule. Um, 
the literature understands Rousseau as presenting a very different sovereign. He also says that everybody comes together to form a unity. Um, the unity becomes the sovereign, but in this case, the sovereign is called the general will. Now, the general will is the will of everybody as a whole. It's not a, a democratic will in the sense that the majority decides what happens. Um, it's a bit more abstract than that. Um, so Rousseau has this famous quote where he says um, that to force somebody to obey the general will is only to force them to be free. Now, what that means is that in some sense or to some extent, the general will overrides individual interests. So we can think of the phrase that you don't know what's good for you. So if my individual interests differ from the general will, um, then I can be forced back in compliance with the general will. So essentially what that means is that it's a very similar picture to Hobbes's Leviathan. Um, we have the unity of people that constitutes the sovereign and the sovereign pursues the common good on our behalf. Um, so Rousseau's idea that the general will um, means that people remain self-legislating because they only comply with um, a body that they are inherently part of, being the general will, um, is, is a wrong reading. Or I'm going to say the literature has read that wrong. So here is the frontispiece to Hobbes's Leviathan, his main work. We have the all-powerful ruler, which is made up of all the little people in society um, that submit themselves to the Leviathan who rules um, towards the common good on their behalf. Um, and so if we imagine the general will, everybody comes together to form the unity of the general will and allows the general will to rule on their behalf towards the common good. So the key takeaway here is that the general will and the Leviathan constitute the same transferal of rights and Hobbes and Rousseau want the basic structure of political society. So returning to my puzzle, the literature understands Hobbes and Rousseau's theories as opposite. Can we use social contract theory to justify a specific regime type? Well, so far it's not looking good. I've shown you that the social contract is the same solution to the same problem and that the relationship between the sovereign and the people is the same under both accounts. And what this means is a third and final point, uh, which is probably the most important point, um, is that the reliance of government on the social contract for its legitimacy is the same. So if a government only exists because the people of the state of nature have come together to form a contract to give their consent to something to rule them, then that government and its own legitimacy and existence relies on that contract. So the purpose of the contract, if we remember, um, and the purpose of government is to provide a situation that's better than the state of nature. If a government fails to do that, um, then they're not fulfilling the contract. And if they don't fulfill the contract and their role to rule, um, then the consent that was given to them initially for that purpose is also nullified. So what that means is um, without fulfilling the contract, uh, the contract is nullified, consent is removed, and government becomes illegitimate. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that um, a government will actually dissolve. Um, they may persist in ruling, um, but their rule is becoming illegitimate. OK, so um, the literature holds that Hobbes and Rousseau represent opposing regime types. I've shown you that um, the government, uh, under both accounts, the government forms out of the same um, uh, problem. It forms through the same mechanism, being the contract. It has the same purpose. And government can be um, illegitimized using the same constraints. And all of this is completely contrary to what the literature understands. Um, as I've said, Hobbes and Rousseau are understood as providing completely different um, uh, theories of uh, political legitimacy and advocating for um, you know, absolutism, absolutism on one hand and republicanism on the other hand. Um, I've shown you that we can actually understand these theories to be pretty much the same. Um, which has interesting implications. Obviously, I've shown that these two opposite theories um, can be the same, but it would be interesting to see further research um, that talks about social contract theory uh, with other major theorists, such as John Locke, or more recently, um, Rawls, the Rawlsian social contract theory. Um, but to reiterate my key message, conventional wisdom is mistaken. Social contract theory cannot be used to justify specific regime types. And before I leave you today, um, I want to encourage you to think about these concepts um, in our everyday lives. So if we think about um, vaccine mandates and the debate going on around um, to what extent government should have power to force people to have vaccines, um, whether you agree with that or disagree with that, um, think about the reasons why um, and think about what the role of government is to you. Um, and then once you have a solid idea about why government exists, 
you have a really good platform to think about um, why government might be misusing power or to what extent you think um, government should be able to dictate um, the things that you do in your personal life. Um, so I'll leave you with this cartoon. Thank you so much for coming to my talk and I hope you enjoy uh, the rest of the conference. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, we now have five minutes for Q&A. So I'll begin by inviting the judges if either of you have questions for our presenter. Look, I wish I had a question because it was it was a really fascinating talk, Evelyn, um, and I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, understood most of it, which was really I was really pleased with because I am, you know, I'm not in philosophy. Um, so, yeah, really pleased that, yeah, by your presentation. I don't have a question, but just, yeah, really well done. Thank you. I also know from philosophy background, so I think, um, yeah, I understand maybe most of it as well. So it's a really good thing. And also, it's a really nice talk, I guess. Thank you. All right, in that case, we have some time for questions from the audience. So if anyone has questions, please raise your hand and we can unmute you or pop your question in the chat and we can read them out. Um, so just give it a moment for anyone to come forward with any questions. It is a challenge to sort of understand this stuff in 10 minutes. So it's totally understandable if you don't have questions, but I think a good option is always to try and relate it back to your own life and um, political theory seems abstract, but really has very real implications. I think there's a hand up. Hi, thanks for unmuting me. Um, great presentation, Eve. I'd like to ask a question on something you touched on kind of towards the end there um, about when the consent is withdrawn from the government. Obviously, structures of power and like the structural um, kind of influences that the government exerts will still continue. Within this theory, is there any room um, for within social contract theory to that, for that consent to be renegotiated and reaffirmed? Um, from the people to the government in these understandings, or how do you kind of understand that? That's a really good question. Um, relates to how you know the implications of social contract theory constraints in the real world. Um, basically, a situation like that would look like a revolution. Um, so, if government uh, fails to produce um, better circumstances than the state of nature, um, there and the contract is nullified, there is definitely opportunity for renegotiation of the contract. Um, and that would come through uh, the form of probably a revolution um, or because it's a return to the state of nature is what happens when government collapses under this theory. Um, people would have to re-consent um, re to forming um, a unity uh, in the sovereign and they might uh, reassess um, who that sovereign should be and whether uh, if the previous sovereign had misused its power, for instance, um, whether they would need to renegotiate um, a certain um, alienation of their own individual rights onto the government. And it's getting a bit jargony now. Um, but essentially, it would look a bit like a situation with the revolution. We can think about the coup in Afghanistan, for instance. Um, the Taliban is trying to renegotiate their rule, um, and that is sort of a social contract um, playing out in real life. Another way to think about it is remember um, the Declaration of Independence of the United States. Um, we the people um, who declared independence from um, the United Kingdom um, and they renegotiated what they wanted to be as a rule and what they wanted to consent to. Um, so again, it all comes back to consent um, and if the people come up with a situation of government that they consent to, um, then the cycle sort of starts again. You can look at it as a, a life cycle of government. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, we do have one more question, so we might move to that. I'll allow you to go ahead and ask. Hi, so um, thanks, Eve. That was a really fantastic presentation. Um, I'm just wondering, why do you think there has been this, um, I guess, understanding in, in the literature that Hobbes and Rousseau are so very different? Why, why do you think people think that rather than emphasizing perhaps their similarities as you have? 
Yeah, thanks for your question, Saren. Um, really interesting question that I've thought about a lot myself. Um, I have been somewhat baffled um, as to why they are considered so opposite, given these very fundamental similarities. Um, I would, <laughs> it's, it's conjecture or it's, um, you know, this is my own view, but I think um, when, when the theories were produced by Hobbes and Rousseau, they were very, very contextual. So Rousseau existed prior to the French Revolution. Um, he existed in a society which was um, incredibly unequal um, and the lower echelons of society bore the worst burden, um, whereas Hobbes lived through um, civil war, um, it, the English Civil War and the Thirty Years' War and was sub, you know, witness to the violence of anarchy. Um, so I think that when people read these theories, they relate to the very strong and emotional language used by both theories. Um, and I think... Sorry to interrupt you, Evelyn. We are at time, so just for fairness, we might move on. But yeah, thank no you for your presentation. <laughs> no worries. Um, we really appreciate it. So that does bring us to the end of today's session. Uh, thank you to our judges, Jishui Zhang and Sarah Walker. Yeah, so the recording will be made available online following the conference. Um, I'd like to congratulate our student presenters today for your presentations, and we hope to see you at other conference sessions this week. Thank you, everyone.